Good morning. morning. All right, Nehemiah 13, you can turn there. I've got a couple things to touch on before we dig into God's word this morning. But as Pastor Mike just kind of brought brought us up to speed on, we have our new interactive missions wall that is out in the foyer. It's something that was part of our 175th anniversary celebration, and we raised some funds together as a church family to do that. And here's our hope with that. It's, it's an opportunity for all of us as a church family to become more connected to our missionaries that are all over the world. So my prayer is that you would take a few moments uh, throughout the next few weeks, walk out, spend a minute or two there. Pastor Mike will be there today right after the service and kind of giving you a crash course on how to do it. But uh, it, is, it is a great tool. Uh, as you choose on missionaries, it brings up ways that you can connect to them, things you can scan to take you right to their newsletters, uh, ways to give directly to them. It's just a, it's a great tool for us as a church family because part of the history of our church, part of the DNA of who we are as a church family is that this has always been a church that has served missionaries and served the world well in that. And we want to continue that on and keep providing tools for us to know who those missionaries are together as a church family. So I want to encourage you in that direction. It's our spring missions weekend this weekend. So we've had multiple opportunities to connect with some missionaries that are in-house. Uh, yesterday, we had our uh, women's coffee talk and our men's breakfast. Our missionaries were there. Friday night, we had our young adult gathering, uh, and our missionaries were there with them as well. Our missionaries are here in the building today. Some of them are over in our kids' wing, spending time with our children and talking about missions and what God's doing around the world. And they'll also be out in the foyer after the gathering this morning. A few of them have tables set up. We want to encourage you to get to know them and, uh, and listen to what God's doing. We'll have some videos in just a minute, but um, I really wanted to just take a minute and focus on that. And, and as a church family, there are lots of ways that you can connect to what God's doing around the world. You can pray, you can go, you can give, uh, you can ask what it looks like for you to be active. Some missionaries we support are right here locally. Uh, we're committed as a church family to reaching our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world as God calls us to. And there's lots of different ways to interact and connect to that. As you do that, as you learn about some of the ways that God is using some of our missionaries, maybe the Lord's putting on your heart to do something. Maybe he's calling you. Uh, to be involved in something. Maybe he's calling you to have a transition in life and uh, serve him in a different way than what you're already doing. I'm not sure what God has for each of us. But connecting with missionaries and hearing more about what God's doing is one way that we listen to that. It's one way that God speaks to us. It's a way that he also moves our hearts. So we're going to take a few minutes now before we jump into God's word. And we're going to watch the videos from uh, a number of our missionaries that are both here and, and also that have sent some videos for us to focus on this weekend. So will you watch with me as we hear from them? Good morning. We're Eric and Amy Couch. We're so glad to be with you here at the Gathering Place for the Missions Weekend. I have so many great memories of growing up here as a kid that, that during the NSBC days. Uh, we are missionaries with Reach Global Crisis Response. We believe that in the wake of every crisis, there is a new missions field. We partner with local churches in times of crisis using construction as our access ministry that helps us build relationships with the homeowners so we can speak into their spiritual needs as well as their physical needs. We are currently serving in Hazard, Kentucky. We've been there since August of 2022 following the flash flooding that happened at the end of July. Um, We're looking forward to this weekend. Thanks again for having us and we can't wait to tell you more about our ministry. Thanks. We have a heart and passion to work with hurt and abused women. I know it's abused all over the world, but what makes it different in our area that she is the one to be blamed, even if she is six years old and she was raped and sexually abused from the father or any sibling, her brother, she is the one to be blamed. It's your fault. You caused this to happen. And if she was raped, they forced her to marry the one who raped her. The woman that worth nothing in the man's or the husband's eye, she is the one to win him for Christ. And they converted to Christianity. They're supposed to be killed, but through God's grace and protection that they're still alive. We have a long program of 12 up to 18 months to equip them, train them, so they multiply. We believe in multiplication because our discipleship ministry is the cornerstone of our ministry. During the last two years, we were able to reach 8 
thousand kids and they were ISIS kids that God touched their heart. From these kids, they were trained and equipped to be bombers. Teacher, teacher, I want to be like Jesus. I told them, I want to be like Jesus to imagine how God is transforming their life. By itself, the name of call her blessed. She feels insecure, I am nothing, nobody cares. So telling her that you are blessed and you will be blessed by receiving Christ in your life. Really, we're seeing them turn to be effective influencer leaders, not fragile, not broken, not weak anymore, but strong and fighter for the Lord. Do you want to be part of this great, wonderful revival that is happening in the area? The door is open. We don't know when it will be closed. So we invite you to come and join us and be blessed and bless others. Hi, I'm Barry Owen. I'm Peggy. We're your World Venture Missionaries serving in Taiwan. I'm serving in a bilingual ministry at the Ujang Church in the city of Kaohsiung. We use English and Chinese to preach, evangelize, and disciple people, both Taiwanese and expatriates. Our goal is to make the Ujang Church a model of ascending church in Taiwan, bringing missions full circle. I serve in a rural ministry in Jiayi County called the Joy House. We share Jesus with children and the elderly in an underserved community with no gospel presence. We are pleased to see God working in new ways in both the rural and urban settings. Thank you for all of your support over these last 35 years. You have been such a blessing to us in our ministry through your prayers and giving. May God continue to bless you as you serve him there in North Syracuse. Hi, TEP Church. My name is Pastor Alex Rivera. I'm the pastor from Casa de Paz. Here is my wife, Ruth. And my son, Alejandro, is recording this video. Um, God bring us from Puerto Rico to Syracuse to plant a church. In 2018, we started this mission uh, in the north side to reach the Hispanic uh, community. At this time, God already sent nine different countries, all Spanish speaking. Um, it's a bless, and we praise the Lord for that. And I want to say thank you, TGP Church, for being a bless to me, to my family, and to Casa de Paz. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Each of those missionaries are serving in different parts of the world, some very close to us uh, here in Syracuse with Casa de Paz, uh, some throughout the United States and others in other parts of the world, both in the Arab world and in the Far East. Uh, so just a remarkable opportunity here from those four missionaries that, that we want to be able to connect with. The Owens are a family that we have supported as a church for a while. Uh, so we are thankful that they get to be home and be with us today, uh, both ministering to our kids and also being around for the weekend. And feel free to touch base and talk with them. The other three couples that uh, you just saw there are three couples that our church is looking to begin supporting as a church family. So you'll be praying for our missions team as they for, finish that process, working through with them, and also praying for those missionaries, uh, that God would continue to work and, and show us what it is that, as a church family, what our part is to be part of what they're doing, what God's using them to do. So let's jump into God's word. Nehemiah chapter 13 connects kind of to what our focus is here for spring missions weekend. We're going to be in verses 10 through 14 of Nehemiah this morning. So you can pull your Bibles, grab that, or your scripture journals. And I'm going to sound a little bit like a middle school teacher uh, with our scripture journals just for a moment. But don't drop me in that category, okay? So um, I don't want to be a middle school teacher. So uh, the scripture journals have been a remarkable tool. Many of you have talked to me about how much they've blessed you. But... I want to encourage you, put your name in the front of them. Okay, so some of them get left here on Sundays, and I get to flip through them a little bit. There's some wonderful notes in there, but we have no idea whose they are. Okay, so they are out in the foyer behind the connect table. Uh, there's, there's a pile there. If you have lost yours, 
please go back, maybe leaf through, find the one. If somebody's got better notes than you, grab theirs. Um, but uh, just try to pick one of those up, all right? We don't want you to lose out on that or have that in the future. We'll be transitioning for the summer here in a few weeks into our Psalm series, Summer in the Psalms again. So last summer, you probably got a Psalms journal. Go ahead and write your name in that one too. Okay, so let's hold on to those. Make sure that you know that those are yours in case they get left behind. We'll know exactly who to contact. Anyway, that's my public service announcement just for a moment. All right, so let's jump into Nehemiah chapter 13. Pastor Ben walked us through a portion of Nehemiah 13 last week and did a great job. So thankful that God has given us people that can preach God's word and do that consistently. And, and today as we kind of go through verses 10 through 14 in Nehemiah 13, We just kind of continue on this stark transition from Nehemiah 12, right? Nehemiah 12 kind of was a a wonderful celebration. The people are doing so well and they're following God and they're they're sticking their commitments. And we get to chapter 13 and there's this contrast. Nehemiah goes back to serve the king. He's gone for, we think, about 12 months, only about a year. And then he comes back to check on things in Jerusalem and everything has fallen apart. In a very short amount of time, Nehemiah was governor there for 12 years. God used him and Ezra to reestablish the people of God, to reestablish what worship looks like and and how God's called them to that, that they've recommitted to, to what God had called them to do as a people. And in the course of 12 months, while Nehemiah's away, the whole thing falls apart. So Nehemiah, while a particular book of the Bible that actually is very encouraging to see what God does, to see how God uses people, to see how God calls us to commit and be faithful to him. Very encouraging. Chapter 13 kind of doesn't end on a great note (laughs) because it's a reminder to us of how easy it is to drift. It's amazingly easy to drift from what God's given you and what he's called you to. And there's one of two things that every believer is doing every single day. You are either drawing in or drifting away. There's no in between. We've talked about this before in in, uh, Nehemiah chapter 10. We talked about this idea of drawing or drifting. You are either drawing closer to God every day, or if you're not, you're drifting away from him. There's no neutral ground And we see that here in the nation of Israel. The the Jewish people, they're drawn in and Nehemiah and Ezra are helping them draw closer to God and what he's called them to. But without that leadership there for a little, just a short period of time, they immediately start to drift. And before you know it, we end up with what we're seeing in Nehemiah 13. Last week, we talked about these promises. Pastor Ben walked us through the first promise that the people had made. And it was the promise that they would separate themselves from the pagan gods and the pagan culture that was around them. And now, I want to just highlight one thing, and Pastor Ben mentioned this too, it's, it doesn't mean you separate yourself from the world and don't have anything to do with the world. It means that you don't intertwine your life with practices and beliefs that are not what God has given us in his word and what he's led us to. So scripture calls us continually to be in the world. That, that's why we're salt and light, right? We're supposed to be in the world. It doesn't mean you don't interact with people that don't know God. It means you don't let your life look like theirs. That's the difference. And that separation promise, that commitment that the people had made back in chapter 10, they had failed to do it. And we saw that last week. Drawing or drifting. In the Christian life, there is no in-between that we are doing one or the other to the commitments we have made to God. So one of the promises that people had made was this separation promise. Today we're going to look at the promise to support the work of God. The promise to support the work of God. This is another commitment that people had made. God said, hey, listen, it's hard as a nation to follow God without any spiritual leaders that you're supporting in order for them to lead you to follow God, to remind you, to to draw you back to his word. And so Through Nehemiah's help, they reestablish that in the middle chapters of this book. And the people make a commitment to God. We will. We will take care of the temple. We will take care of the Levites. We will take care of the priests. Because we know that our worship of God is important. And here already, they've forgotten. They've forgotten. Let's read verses 10 through 14 together. And then we'll dig in to see what God has for us today as a reminder. 
Nehemiah 13, verse 10. I also found that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his own fields. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and I set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the wine, and the oil into the storehouses. And I appointed his treasurers over the storehouses, Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padiah the, of the Levites. And as their assistants, Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable. And their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this. And do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. May God bless his word to us this morning as we see what it is that he has for us in these four verses, 10 through 14. As Nehemiah takes what has been undone because the people of God have drifted in such a short period of time away from him. And he takes what's been undone and he puts it back into place. So you got to think for Nehemiah, this, this is kind of like very disappointing, right? He spends 12 years serving the Lord, watching the Lord do miracles all around. The people see the miracles, they commit to, oh yes, now we remember. We remember God's word, we see what God is doing, we remember who God is and we're committing ourselves to it. And then he goes away for a year because he has to honor his own commitments back with the king. And when he comes back to check, they're not doing any of it. Remember last week, we looked at the fact that Tobiah had actually set up house inside one of the rooms in the temple, one of the storehouses. Why? Because the people weren't filling the storehouses. They were empty. And the Levites and the people who were supposed to lead worship, because the storehouses were empty, they had to leave and go plant their own fields and, and make a way to stay alive. In the middle of all that, they bring in a guy who's an enemy of God, and they set up house in the temple. I mean, it, it feels like this wasn't like a little drift, right? It feels like this is like an about face of 180 walking in the other direction. But the reality is this in our own spiritual lives. You never end up that far from what God's called you to overnight. It's a small compromise that bleeds you into that direction. It's deciding on one little thing. I know God's told me that, but I just, I don't feel like I can do that. I feel like I need to do something else than what God's told me to do. And every little compromise away from the will of God and his call in your life makes the next little compromise even easier. And you make another little compromise. And after that, you make another little compromise. And before you know it, you got empty storehouses and people living in the temple. They didn't do it the day Nehemiah left. It was a short progression, I'm sure, that led them off, way off track. This is a reminder for us. Nehemiah 13 is not the everyone lived happily ever after story ending, right? It's the everybody messed everything up story ending. And God had to send someone in to clean it back up and to put it back in place. And this is such a reflection, if we're honest, of our own spiritual lives, right? It's... It's this reality that we live in that we're seeing played out here in Nehemiah. If we are not diligent every day to commit ourselves to the Lord, to commit ourselves to his calling, to remind ourselves through his word and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to remember that day, this is who I am, this is who God is, and this is what he's called me to do. See, without these reminders, without a, a daily and maybe even a multiple times per day reminder, we will drift. We will drift. And we've all had this in our spiritual lives where we begin to drift. And maybe the beginning is just a little bit. But then you've probably had in your spiritual life at one point where you wake up one day and you ask yourself, how in the world did I get here? What, what, what is going on? I'm, I'm so much farther away from the Lord than I want to be. 
But how did I get here? It was the minuscule things that lead into a larger separation. And we see it here in Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes to set it straight for the people. So he goes and finds these Levites and he says to them, you need to get back into doing what God's called you to do. Because the people will not be following God consistently without a consistent call to worship and honor their commitments. These promises that were made back in chapter 10, verses 28 and 30 through 31, and verse 39 is where we see this promise. In 1039, we see the promise of the people to support the work of God. It's very clear right there in Nehemiah 1039. These promises were things that the people needed to have reminders for. We see this all throughout God's story, right? We just sang about these monuments, these altars, these remembrances that get put up in different places of our lives, right? And as they get put up in different places of our lives, we bump into them and we remember, oh, that's what God did. I remember that now. Why did God have them take 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan River and build a monument on the other side when they went into the Holy Land? so that future generations would see a pile of rocks and ask, what's all that all about? And people would, their, their parents and grandparents, and they would say, your ancestors believed God, and God did miraculous things, and still does. That, that's what those remembrances are for us. So I see Nehemiah 13 literally is that for us spiritually. This is a reminder we can drift far from God at a very easy pace and find ourselves in a place we would never really pick to be in. Or we can draw near to him consistently because we have set up monuments and memorials in our life to what God has done. So that when we're not remembering, we bump into it. Remember, no, that's, that God is that good. I remember now he has done that much for me. The promises in chapter 10, the promise of support for the work of God was that they were supposed to do three distinct things. In verses 34 through 39, they were supposed to give wood for the sacrifices and for the Levites to use for warmth and, and food. They were supposed to give food to fill the storehouses so that the Levites were taken care of and also so that the sacrificial, sacrificial system could continue on. And they were supposed to give of their finances. Those three, so if you remember, those are the ones we talked about in chapter 10. This, this commitment of support was threefold for the people of God, and they willingly did it in chapter 10. And God provided, and the work of the Lord continued on. But here's the interesting thing that we talk about here in, verse thir in chapter 13. The reason that God revisits this, I believe, for us is because giving and generosity is both a thermostat and a thermometer for your spiritual life. Giving and generosity is a thermostat and a thermometer for your spiritual life. And here's what I mean by that. It not only measures our spiritual temperature, right, which a thermometer does, it measures the temperature of things, tells you when you walk into your house and you go to the thermostat, there's little numbers on there. It tells you what it's supposed to be and it tells you what it is, right? The thermostat gets set to where it's supposed to be. The thermometer tells you what it is. And here's an interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever had this experience in your life, but if you're a homeowner, you probably have. Sometimes, hopefully not too often, you walk over to your, to your thermostat and it says it's supposed to be, whatever the temperature, 68 in here in the middle of the winter, but it's 62. What does that tell you? There's something wrong. Your heater's not working, right? There's something going on. Maybe you left a window open with the heat on, or maybe it's totally dead and it's not cranking on any heat and your, heat, your house is going to get continually colder and colder. But this is what generosity shows us in our own lives and in our spiritual walk. Because people who have kept God at the center of their life understand that all things have come from him. Therefore, their hands are open in their generosity. It's not ours to hold on to. But the people forgot that. And the giving and generosity went away. And they were worried about providing for themselves and taking care of themselves instead of trusting God and doing what he had called them to. 
And when they do that, guess what? All of a sudden, Nehemiah comes back and says, hey, your spiritual temperature is supposed to be here, and it's here. That's a problem. This is, this is what God called you to. This is a commitment you made to him as well. But you're living down here. Your spiritual life has gone cold. And the reason that the, the giving promise, the reason that the support promise that God puts in there, I think in chapter 10, and, and honestly in every phase of the, the history of God's people, is because generosity is a thermostat and a thermometer. Those who understand how much they have been given, give freely. When God's people start to decline spiritually, one of the first places it shows up is their generosity. Matthew 6, verse 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this was an indicator to Nehemiah. When he went into the storehouse, one, I mean, we already saw Nehemiah got a little, got a little forceful here, right? He was, he was pulling people by their hair and <laughs> throwing them out of places, okay? So we're, we're not going to do that, don't worry, okay? So, um, but the reality is Nehemiah comes back, and he, even rightfully so, is righteously upset about where the people are. And the fact that Tobiah, who basically tried to undermine everything God was doing earlier, is now living in the temple. He runs him out. He chucks all his stuff out of there. He throws Tobiah out, and he corrects the people that let him do it. And here he does the same thing here with this other commitment, the commitment to support the work of God. It says that he names these guys... He goes out, he finds the men that he knows are faithful, and he pulls them back and puts them in positions to lead. And he says, listen, remind the people, fill the storehouses. Go find the priests and the Levites, bring them back. Provide for them so they can lead in worship. Why is this so important? Because God, in his abundance grace towards us, has been more generous than we will ever fully fathom. You're, you and I are never going to get to a place where we can understand the mystery of the sacrifice that the Father has gone through in order to make the gospel real in our lives. We sing about it every week. We talk about the gospel continually. Why? Because it is everything for us. There's lots of other things we can get distracted by and, and spend our time on. And it's not that those things are not important at some level spiritually and for the life of a church. But here's the one thing. If we miss the most important act of grace and generosity, everything else will eventually fall apart. This church has been in existence for 175 years. One of the reasons, well, the primary reason is God is faithful, even when we are not. But one of the other reasons is, I believe this church has been incredibly generous over its lifetime. I don't know a lot of churches that give towards, particularly, and we're having a missions weekend, towards the work of God in other parts of the world like this church does. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord that we stand on the shoulders of people that have gone before us that have cast this DNA. But not only that, in our history, even in the last year, God has been amazingly faithful. We had a pretty aggressive generosity goal with our 175th anniversary, and God took us right past it, blew right past it. Why? Because God honors generosity, and faithfulness. Now, we don't do these things. We don't make promises of God to, order, to, to earn his favor. We make commitments to the Lord because we understand that he's already brought his favor to us in Christ. And we have to keep that equation in the right direction. We've got to be careful, and this is why. Where your treasure is, there your heart is going to go. If you think you can buy God's favor by trying to give more, he's going to remind you that he doesn't need it. He's not short on cash, okay? It's not about that. 
It's about the fact that we understand how much he has done for us and what he has brought to us in Jesus Christ. And out of that favor that he's bestowed on us through grace, we respond in generosity. But God's people and spiritual decline amongst God's people can often be measured by their generosity. Secondly, we see how Nehemiah responds. Nehemiah responds by praying. At the end of verse 14 here, he's talking to God. Now he does some actual strategic things and puts some people back into places to serve and to lead and to make sure that worship is happening. But then what does he do? He talks to God. And in this verse, this is the seventh prayer that we see out of the 10 that we, that we see in 13 chapters that Nehemiah prays. This is the seventh one. There's three more coming before the end of this chapter. And what does that tell us that Nehemiah's immediate response is almost always pray. Stop and pray. Stop and pray when he knew what was going on in Israel all the way back in chapter one. Stop and pray when the king pulls him in and says, what's wrong and what do you want? Stop and pray. Stop and pray when he gets there and sees how bad it is. Stop and pray when the people around him are coming in and opposing God's worth and trying to undermine it. He stops and prays first. And here he does the same thing. He puts people in place and then he asks the Lord, okay, Lord, please remember what I've done here. And this particular prayer, this particular verse can sound a little self-serving, but I don't believe that's what Nehemiah is doing. I believe Nehemiah is asking the Lord to remember that his people have once again responded. Remember, they've, they've come back. Because we do see when faithful people are put into place, the, the system that God has established for us, it goes right back into function here. Those faithful men got back in the places they should, started serving, and worship was reestablished. And I don't believe Nehemiah is saying, Lord, remember just for me. I, say, I think he's saying, remember what's going on here. Don't judge us by the, the drifting that just happened, please. Remember that we have reestablished our walk with you. And this is the walk of the Christian life, right? The, the continual effort it takes to repent and start again. Repentance and renewal, they start with prayer. The prayer here is recorded, is the first one recorded since chapter six. And Nehemiah prays it fervently. He asks the Lord, Remember me, oh my God, concerning this. And what is the this? That particular word, this, is tied back to the previous actions that he reestablished. And, and I think this is a good model for us as people who should be serving and leading in some area in the family of God. It's okay to ask the Lord, hey, remember that we're following you. We see it all through the Psalms. The psalmist continually, not as though God needs reminding, but it's healthy for us to have a hope in the Lord that he would remember when he is working and we are walking with him well. It's okay to, to have that remembrance. It's okay to ask the Lord to remember that we repent and start again. Mostly because that's what God's called us to do in our spiritual life. We're all broken sinners. We're not really that different than Israel here, right? Sometimes it's easy. You read scripture and you're like, what does it matter with these people? You ever do that? Okay. Like, Man, these, these people are stuck on a hamster wheel. They just keep, I mean, they're going nowhere. But we have to be humble about this and understand. We make decisions probably every day that don't reflect a heart that sees God for who he is and what he's done for us. And we have to take inventory regularly. Why? Because if we don't take regular inventory, what happens? The storerooms end up empty and we end up far from him. So the storerooms of your life are filled up as you spend time with the Lord, as you spend time in God's word, as you commune and talk with him, as you serve him like he's called you to, and you see God changing people's lives. Because when 
When God changes somebody's life in front of you or draws somebody into the family of God through salvation and grace, there is no better energy to fill up those storerooms. But we're not doing that stuff. Things get pretty dry. You end up just checking the box and showing up every once in a while. God has so much more for his people than that. And that's what he's trying to tell the people here. It's why he sends Nehemiah back from fulfilling his commitment. As he goes back and he says, guys, you've forgotten and everything's getting dry again. Commit again. Commit again and do it again now. Is what Nehemiah leads the people into. And it's what God has for us today too. What is God calling you and I to say, I need to be careful to not drift. And the only way to not drift is to draw closer to him every day. And I have to be disciplined and commit myself to draw closer to him every day. If I don't, I'm going to find myself far from him. Not because I chose to walk way away, just because I drifted slowly. Giving is a thermostat and a thermometer of our walk with Jesus. And problems are fixed when we pray. Those are the two lessons I think that God has for us from these particular verses. And that he had for me as I was studying and kind of walking my way through is, we need to be committed. Don't, don't rest on yesterday's stuff. <laughs> Just because you did well yesterday in your spiritual life and spent time with the Lord, don't think that's going to carry you through today. Do it again. Just because, you know, months ago you responded when God called you to generosity on something, don't, don't think that's going to carry you forever. Continue on being generous. Because he's been overwhelmingly generous to us. And in our lives, it's not, it's not all about, and this is something we got to be careful of, it's not all about money, okay? But our treasure does reflect where our heart is. This is about your time. This is about giving you of your talents. This is about serving the way that God's called you to. This is about the whole package, folks. God doesn't want one area of your life. He wants you. And if you're willing to do that, he will create and sustain the kind of spiritual revival and vitality that we see all the way up through chapter 12. And he'll keep it going. Because our personal spiritual walk is what fans the flame, as Pastor Ben talked to us last week about. Fans the flame in our lives and keeps us burning bright for him. So as we look in these last couple of sermons in Nehemiah, we're going to finish over the next couple of weeks. I believe 13 is here as a reminder. We have spent months and months walking our way through Nehemiah. We've learned lots of things. I've learned lots of things. I hope somebody else has. But we've learned lots of things, right, through Nehemiah. And 13 is the litmus test. It's the reminder. Hey, all that great stuff we've been reading about, all the wonderful things God does, if you forget about him, they dry up. We have to remember him every day and honor the commitments that we've done every day and he will continue to move and work in our lives. And we, our lives will be spiritually vital. Our thermostat and our thermometer will measure up. Instead of looking and saying, wow, I'm supposed to be up here and I'm way down here. But in a large part, God measures that through our generosity. Are we willing to give what he's called us to give? Let's pray and ask the Lord to do that as we, as we enter in today as the, one of the Sundays that we observe the Lord's table together. And I hope that you received elements when you came in this morning. And in a moment, we're going to come and before the Lord's table, we're going to talk about what he has done for us and remind ourselves once again that our hearts should be ones that are full of gratitude. That our hearts should be ones that respond to the amazing work that he has done in our lives. Through Jesus, for every one of us.